this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today I'm joined by Akiko Yamakawa who is a Japanese lawyer or bengoshi as we call them in Japan. Akiko is an amazing lawyer with her specialist expertise in employment law and dispute resolution. Many of you listening will know that Japan is a country where employees have heavy protection under the law and Akiko finds herself each day answering the questions of her financial service and multinational clients and helping them navigate their ways so that they can operate their businesses in Japan in compliance with the employment law requirements. Akiko also helps clients design their rules of employment. She crafts watertight employment contracts for the employees of the corporates she works with. As we all know, sometimes despite our best efforts as lawyers and business owners, things don't always go according to plan. And I like to think of Akiko as many a corporate's nightess and shining red armor. Why red, you say? Well, it's actually Akiko's signature color. I've seen her wearing red a lot. It's very bold and assertive, just like she is. So she gallops in and deals with all of these employment-related disputes, including the sometimes pretty uncomfortable area of employee and executive-level dismissals. She's like a moth to the flame for all these tougher areas of internal and regulatory investigations and employment core proceedings. In my eyes, Akiko is really... I guess the go-to, the one-stop shop for the whole spectrum of employment matters like overtime pay and retirement benefits and redundancies. She's always got this coaching mindset as well and trying to help clients and guide them at the front end with training programs and employee performance management and anti-harassment training. So when clients contact me for help with employment law matters, Akiko is my first point of call and she has helped several of them resolve their issues. She has a delightful sense of humor that I just love. Uh, I immediately warmed to her the day I met her because of that humorous card that she plays. And I hope that she can let you see a little bit of that as we talk today. I witnessed her launch her law firm here. I've admired seeing her stand on stage to win multiple law awards year, year after year. And she goes from strength to strength as she strategically manages her team and her career path and her pioneer pioneering employment law footprint in Japan. Yes, you can tell I am a fangirl of Akiko and I'm super proud to have her as my guest today. Akiko, welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. Great to have you here. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is very exciting. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Today, we're going to be talking about your career, um, how and why you moved from big law to launch your own specialist employment law boutique firm here in Japan, some of the issues and challenges you're facing, and I'd really love you to also offer some gems of advice for young lawyers on their career path here. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay, well, today we're talking offline because we're still in a post- state of emergency in Japan, but if we were meeting up in person, and I hope we can do that soon, is there a favorite wine bar or a favorite restaurant that you love to go to? And what would you be choosing off the menu? So I don't really have a favorite wine bar, but um, I've been thinking about it. Now I want to go to eat something Spanish, like a tapas, and probably I'll be having sangria. Oh, sounds fantastic. I would love to go there with you someplace to do that. Perhaps we can find a time after this to do that together. Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to think too, back to when we first met. I said at the intro that I loved you when I met you with your sense of humor. And I think it was when we had the Women in Law Japan panel discussion back in May 2018. So it's around three years ago. I think you and I appeared on that panel with Keiko Ohara and John Sasaki, uh, Mangyo Kinoshita and Reed Munro Sheridan. And at that time, I think we were talking about our solo and small firm businesses and, and sharing our tips and gems with people. Was that when it was? 
I think so. I remember that event quite clearly because we had some wine before we were on stage. So I was like a little bit drunk. <laughs> so it was a very enjoying experience. That's right. And I think that's how I remember you because it was quite inspiring for me to meet someone who had decided to have a few drinks before starting. And I'm, I'm quite the opposite. I won't drink before I do a presentation. So uh, that, that really touched me. And I, I kind of, if I can say, that's where you became my, you know, my person that I really liked. And I was a fangirl of you from then. Thank you. I don't know if it was a good idea, but I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. I can't remember at the time how you introduced yourself, but when you do introduce yourself to people, how do you introduce yourself? And sometimes people are different when they are lawyers, speaking with lawyers, or they're speaking with uh, people who are non-lawyers. How do you introduce yourself? That's a interesting question. If I'm talking with lawyers or in a business context, I'll probably just introduce myself as an employment lawyer. If I'm speaking with someone completely not related to work, I tend to try to not tell people I'm a lawyer because it's quite intimidating. So I try to move away from the topic of what's, what I'm doing. What, what do you do instead then? How do you do I don't it? know. I mean, I just, well, people ask me what you're doing. I do something, well, something to do with law. And then I just quickly change the topic. It's very interesting you say that because I'm I'm very similar. Sometimes I don't want people to know or judge me or th get an impression of me immediately by what I do as a job. I'd rather them get to know me first. Is that kind of what you're saying is the same way that you approach things? I think so. And, you know, I'm getting older, so I'm getting used to it. But when you were like very young, like in, like in, the early 20s or not early 20s, late 20s. And if you go to somewhere like to get your hair cut and they ask you what you're doing. And if I say I'm a lawyer, they'll just kind of like not talk to you anymore because they're so scared with you. Or they might so I try off, to, yeah. Chop off your hair yeah. unexpectedly. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, yeah, well, we're quite similar in that way. I like people to get to know me as well and then say, yeah, I, I usually say that too. I work in the law. And then as, pro, as the conversation progresses, I tell a little bit more. But it was quite a while ago now that you were admitted as a Japanese Bengoshi, I think 22 years ago in 1999. And you also have a New York State Bar qualification. Uh, I read on your bio that you did an LLM at Harvard Law School in 2003. So I think that must have been while you were at Freshfields and around the time I was in Japan taking on my second role at Panasonic. So tell me a little bit more about that early stage of your career path. What got you into the law and why you chose this career in law and your early stages working as a lawyer? Yeah, that's another interesting question. I've never kind of consciously made the decision that I wanted to be a lawyer. But um, when I was in university, for example, me joining a big Japanese corporation was quite, it looked like a pretty unpleasant experience because you'd be super minority. And so a lot of my friends were also taking the bar exam it, only because it was easier for females to have a, a, a professional life if you have some kind of a qualification. And so it was pretty much, it wasn't really a conscious choice, but it was more like being a lawyer is probably easier kind of choice. And that's what, how I ended up being a lawyer. And I, I think that was a very good choice because I, I think I'm quite fit to be a lawyer. So, you know, it, it ended up all very well. When you say you're fit to be a lawyer, what does that mean? Is it your approach, the ana anal analytic kind of approach that you have to, to your work? What is it that makes you think that? Well, it's a more bit of other way around in that, you know, being an employment lawyer, I see lots of people working at big corporations. And I think I'm probably not very good at working at big organizations. So being independent is probably much better for me. I see. Right. So when you were a child then, going back even further, did you, what did you want to be? Did you, you obviously were not in, aspiring to be a lawyer, but what was on your mind then is I want to be a uh, when I grow up? So another interesting question, I was thinking about it, but I, I didn't really have any dream job. It's all very appalling, but I was looking a couple of months ago, I was looking at what we call the sotsugyo bunshu. That's, some, that's kind of a little writing that people do when you graduate from primary school. So I was like 12, 13. And there was this little section where people were writing what you want to be when in the future. And I was just so surprised to see what I wrote. I wrote that I want to marry a CEO and have two kids. It's just like, 
wow, <laughs> it's got nothing's <laughs> got true. And that I don't even want to be that anymore. <laughs> it's How just so funny. I wonder, you wonder at that time if your friends, you know, also writing the same little sentences were influencing you or what the scene was at that time. How funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't really understand. Maybe I was trying to be funny. I just don't Maybe. know. It was just so crazy I had some memory that you you had someone in your family who was a lawyer wasn't it your father or have I got that completely wrong no well we've, there's no one in my family who's a lawyer my father's a salary man right okay so are there any other role models in your in your family or around you that influenced you at any stage to really hone in on becoming a lawyer I don't think so although my parents just didn't say anything about my career or what I should be doing so they, they let me make my own decisions which I which I, I really respect them for that I, I don't recall at any time them telling me that I should do this or that on, on almost anything really sounds fantastic I mean that's really very similar again to how I was brought up and when I said I was going to study Japanese, my family were, oh, okay. And when I wanted to leave being a tour guide and do law, it was, oh, okay. So there was never any turn back on that. And I think that's really instrumental for both you and I in that we didn't have any pushback. And had we had that, we might not have turned out to be where we are now. Absolutely. So what is it about your work that you're doing now, your job that you really like um, as a lawyer, some aspects of your work that you find really make you feel some joy? I think there are two aspects. One is because I do employment, I do get a chance to meet a lot of people that I probably won't be meeting if I wasn't doing this. So for example, if I was doing a case in a, I don't know, big corporation in the you know, operations department or whatever, and then you get to know people and ask them what they're doing. It's really fascinating to know that there's so many jobs out there, of course, but you know you don't really get a chance to really ask what you do on a daily basis. And you and again, you meet lots of people, not just the legal people or HR. You also meet the people actually doing the business, which is also fun. The other thing I actually quite like is the contentious part of my business. I do a lot of contentious employment matters. So that's litigation, negotiations, shouting at union members and <laughs> stuff like that. And, you know, being, it, it's not very, it's not a very pleasant experience if you're being aggressive or angry for something personal. But if you're just advocating someone's view and you can be aggressive and it's your job, it's actually quite stress relieving <laughs> and it's very exciting. So I, I do like the contentious part of my job as well. That's interesting. And does that actually mean that you show another side of your personality that you can't show when you're privately acting, right? It gives you another chance to almost act or be somebody else in that role as you're being a litigator or in these content, contentious, contentious, <laughs> contentious matters. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never thought of it that way, but maybe, yes, because if you're doing cross-examination, you feel a bit like you're, you're, you're acting and, you know, it's, adrenaline starts flowing and all that. So there, there might be a little bit of that as well. Right. Well, I'm sure you had a bit of that when you were still at Big Law uh, at Freshfields, and then um, you moved away from that to set up your own practice, which is called Vanguard Law. Tell me a little bit about that then, the 12 months or so before that, that led you to break away from from your own firm. And I really want to know how you came up with this name, Vanguard Law. So the, the reason why we started, well, it's not just me, it's me and Kazuki and Naoki. So it was the three of them. We, we kind of spun off from fresh fields. It was, it was a very amicable spin off. And the, the only reason was because I was losing, we were losing synergy with the with the rest of the Tokyo office. The Tokyo office of Fresh Rules was focusing much more on outbound work, where our practice was very inbound. So, you know, it didn't really make much sense for us to be on the same platform. So we thought that would be better on both sides if we just spun off for the practice altogether. So that's how the firm was built. On Vanguard, again, very interesting question. Um, we were really struggling with coming up with names and it had to be an English term because most of our clients are non-Japanese so we couldn't use a Japanese name. But then if you started looking for words that actually had a meaning that people could understand in Japan, they all felt a little bit dasai. <laughs> so, you know, things like justice or, you know, those kind of words 
not really. So we wanted a word that people didn't really quite understand what it meant. And we thought that Vanguard was actually quite good because I didn't really know what Vanguard meant, but it sounded like a cool name. And if you look it up in the dictionary, it has a pretty nice meaning. And the person who actually gave me that name was my father, but he had completely forgotten about it. So he gave me a list of names and I said, I'm going to call it Vanguard. And he's like, oh, that's a very nice name. Who, where did you get that from? It's like, it was on your list. I doesn't even remember, but that's really how we ended up with Vanguard. Oh, there you go. That must have been the thing that I was thinking about related to your dad. So, you know, kudos to uh, him. Yep. Kudos to him. And so you have this name, Vanguard Law. You've gone out with these two other two other chaps. Uh, they're two both males, right? Kazuki and yep. Naki, right? Yes. And so how long did it take to set up your practice? Like for me, when I set up my practice, it took the better part of a year with the Guy Ben foreign lawyer registration and dual requirements from New Zealand um, and Japan. So how about how about for a Bengoshi in terms of you finding your the office, partnership agreements, licenses, regulations, those kinds of things? You know, it wasn't that difficult. I recall that I made up my my mind to spin off in December and then I spoke with Kazuki in January and then we, we were starting our new firm in September so I think it was a little over six months or so because on the licensing bit if you're a Bengwashi it's, it's, it's super easy it's all just paperwork and I think it was more around infrastructure office space um, hiring and all that took a little bit of time but overall I didn't find it that painful Right okay and so before you mentioned the word dasai which which I think is probably dowdy or, um, you know, not very exciting. And so you went the absolute opposite of that to build your office in Marunouchi, which is right in the centre of Tokyo. So you're obviously looking for something that matched the name of Vanguard and the way that you wanted to attract your clients. Is that right? Well, yeah, well, I mean, we weren't really thinking of Marunouchi in the first, uh, at the beginning because we thought it was super expensive. But we were looking around and once the, once the real estate agency takes you to Marunouchi, you kind of feel like I want to be there. And then some of the buildings are actually not that expensive rent-wise. So we were quite lucky to find a nice little space in the Marunouchi area where we, where we could start. Right. Okay. That's interesting. And so you didn't really have too much trouble over six months to get set up, but was there something else inside of you that you needed to break away from big law, like that mindset that you needed? Because, you know, when I set up, there are people, people have different reactions to when you pull away from such a big, glamorous, so-called big, glamorous job. What was that like for you from, you know, deep inside the mindset to break away from big law? And how did people react to you doing that break? Away. Mindset. I mean, I, I don't really want to say anything negative about the big firms because there are very, I, I love Freshfields and I still love Freshfields, but being part of a big organization can sometimes be quite stressful. So I had to do all the business plans and my business plan had to meet the overall firm strategy. And obviously there's sometimes a little bit of conflict there. So I just, I did want a little bit more, much more liberty and just do what I wanted to do. So that's one thing. Um, in terms of people around me, when I was starting thinking of leaving Freshfields and setting up my own firm. I had already almost kind of made up my mind, but I did speak with a couple of um, female lawyers, including Keiko O'Hara that was on the panel um, that where we first met. And everyone was so like encouraging. No one said anything negative and everyone was like, yeah, yeah, just go ahead. And so I thought that if no one's telling me anything negative, it's probably the best thing to do. Very interesting. How about with people ex who weren't lawyers when you told others about the fact that you were doing this? Did they also have that same jubilant reaction? I, I think so. I, again, my parents were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then my <laughs> friends were, were like kind of excited because I was still talking with my friends about, you know, what should I do with the f firm furniture and all that? And everyone was kind of, you know, giving me ideas. So we were all enjoying the experience together. Oh, it's really wonderful. Um, I'm so glad you had that. For some people who I spoke to, they would say things like, really, you're leaving your big corporate job to do your own law firm. So sometimes I had that kind of reaction. I'm glad you didn't. But I sort of think when people react like that, that it's almost a reflection of themselves in a mirror perhaps their own risk level um, and their appetite for leaving a comfortable job and going and doing something a little bit more revolutionary. So kudos to you for doing that. So how long ago was that that you set up the firm? 2007, 
2017, I think. Yeah, September 2017. Okay, right. Okay, that's good. And so you mentioned that you've still got a good relationship with Freshfields and you love them. So I imagine there is still some workflow that comes through from them to you as well without going into the uh, yes. Yeah. <gasps> yes. Yeah, because I'm fresh because we left Freshfields doesn't no longer does Japanese employment law. So naturally we, I, I do work together with them and it's it's really nice. Great. And so you I mentioned at the top of the show a little array of all the work that you do. Can you just share maybe uh, a little bit more about the kinds of work that your firm does and if there's anything interesting that's been happening lately these days without obviously telling all your secrets, but tell us a bit more about the kinds of work you're, do- you're doing. So, so Vanguard focuses on providing Japanese legal advice to multinational, meaning non-Japanese corporates with operations in Japan. So we intentionally only target non-Japanese companies and we're very strong in employment and, and disputes. So that's that's where I think we're a bit unique because there's lots of many good boutique, say, employment law firms in Japan, but none of them focus solely on the international firms. So that um, that's what I did. Sorry, I for- forgot what you were asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, is there anything interesting? Anything interesting that you're doing at the moment um, with one of the international firms? It's a bit depressing, but with all the COVID, as you can imagine, we're quite busy with with, with all sorts of employment issues. So right. when the economy's not doing very well, uh, we tend to become busy, which is a bit depressing. But you can really un- see where the economy is going, just looking at your workflow. Exactly. Yeah, that that is the case. And I think niching down or niching down, as we like to say in America as well, niching down to, you know, non-Japanese companies, right, intentionally, some people would say that's a great idea. Others, you know, they, when they go out on their own, they will do a whole lot of different kinds of work in order to get workflow through the door. So you've found that honing in on that niche has been a really good thing for you at Vanguard. Is that right? Yes, yes. It was very good for branding because otherwise people will say like, what does Vanguard do? Because, But we have a very clear like focus in terms of our practice areas. That's great. And you, are you still with the two two chaps you mentioned who are three of you as partners or have you taken on other people in the firm? Partner-wise, we now have two, three, four partners. So uh, we've joined, uh, Akira has joined, he does corporate. And so we've, we now have got th- four partners. And you are the female partner in the firm? Yes. Have you had any challenges along the way with being that only woman in your firm in Japan? Not really. I mean, associates, we've got quite a good mix of male and female. And also client-wise, maybe I'm quite lucky because I do employment law because there's a lot of employment counsel, in-house employment counsel or HR professionals who are female. So I don't really feel like I'm a minority when I'm doing employment work at least. Right, because your counterparts are often females in those particular uh, departments and corporates. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that makes sense. So I'm sure that there's people listening who'd really like to hear more about the differences for you between working in the large firm and, you know, including as being a partner and now with your own law law firm. And I think this is actually a question that may have been asked to you on the panel uh, several years ago, but the differences between the large firm and now and maybe pros and cons of each kind of work. Right. That's a that's a difficult question. Pros and cons. There are many good things that about working at large firms like like the like like the Freshfields and 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 the sort of like that. I think it was very good for my career to first start with the big law firms because you you meet a lot of people. It's like a little society in the law firm itself, especially if it's like a global massive firm like Freshfield. So you you get to meet a lot of interesting person just within your own firm and. Because Freshfield is a global firm, it's not just Japan, but I get to meet great people in other jurisdictions like London, Hong Kong, the US or Italy or wherever, like all the way across the world. And that has been a very good experience. And the people there, you meet incredibly smart people. It's like, wow, this person is a genius. And you get that kind of experience, which I think would be quite difficult if you were just doing a small practice by you. And you have to be, you will have to do super networking to get that own experience within a small setting. So I, I think that's the good thing about being in a big, firm and obviously you get very good clients 
turning to the private, more smaller practice, I think it's the level of autonomy and freedom that you get. Because again, I can set my own fee levels. I can choose what kind of clients I want to serve and all that. And so it's the freedom bit is much larger when you are in, in a smaller law firm. Absolutely. I think you've, you've hit it spot on and you've, you, you've mentioned liberty, freedom, autonomy, and that, that ability to set your own fee levels, which is absolutely right. And kudos to you on that one. In terms of long-term success for someone who might be thinking about going out on their own and doing what you've done, are there any tips you would like to provide to anyone who's thinking about setting up their own practice? Um, I think two things. One is that you just really need to have a focus area because there are so many small law firms. You need to have some kind of a, what do you call it? Kind of a, like a big message board that tells people what you do. So you, you can't just do like, I just generally do everything. I don't think it, it's going to work, especially because things are getting very competitive um, in, in this market as well. The other thing that I'm focusing on right now is, is really to bring up the next generation because I'm going to retire and hopefully I want to retire <laughs> when I'm still healthy and young-ish. <laughs> and if you want to continue this platform, you do need the next generation who will who, who will basically take over. And I, I started this law firm thinking about, this is not my law firm. I'm just creating a platform for lawyers who want to do international work outside the big global firms. And so I've created this platform. So I would love to have someone really use this platform going forward to provide Japanese legal advice to the multinational corporates. Wow. I've never heard anyone refer to their firm as a platform for others. That's really quite distinctive. Um, how many then in your team who are in this platform with you, how many people are you looking after? So we now have um, 10 associates. So it's a good team. And do you have them dedicated to you and to Akira and your other, other, other partners or are they helping all of you in different ways? They're help, helping everyone. So we don't really have any teams. We're too small for that. And, and so everyone does, ev everyone does everything. So that's a little bit different then, obviously, to big law, where people are very much associates are dedicated to a certain partner. I guess, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think people, at least at Freshfields, people are dedicated to a certain practice area, but not so much partners. Because Freshfields and also my firm, we, we kind of do a lockstep kind of system. So it's not like the income that I, the business I bring in doesn't directly reflect to my income, if you say what I mean. So we just pull every, all the income and just divide it among the partners. So it's not like the more I work, the more I get. I mean, if Akira does a lot of work, I might be able to get more money <laughs> because Akira is bringing more money. That's the way we do it. Right. I see. So you pull all of the income that's come from all the partners and then divide it up equally. Exactly. So then there's absolutely no fight for associates for one thing, because they're just one big team and there's no fight for clients because if, if someone at Vanguard does the work, then that's fine. So then obviously the best person will, will end up doing it. Right. Well, that, that's interesting. Is that kind of typical, though, of other smaller firms that you know of? Or is your that, that way of doing things, that model, is that a little bit different at Vanguard? I think it's... Well, I'm sure there are other firms that do it. I don't think it's 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 probably not mainstream. So when we hire people at mid level, or we we do tell them that this is the way we do because we we want everyone to at least want to become partner, and I think they should know what the partnership is going to look like. Right. And so I imagine that the way that you're doing this is really a motivator for your team. How else are you um, nurturing and growing that that team of yours, that ten associates? to be that next you know, next generation that you're talking about? I try to give them as much exposure to clients that I can. So, for example, all, most of the advice that comes out of our firm will come from the associates. I will obviously review them. But the email itself, I encourage my associates to, to send out and then they will receive contact directly from the clients. And, you know, I just want them to build their own relationship with, with the clients. And, and they seem to like that. Mm, that's really interesting. And the other question I do have to ask you is what it's like being an employment lawyer who is also an employer? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Whenever I 
provide employment advice I tr- I just forget about I try to forget about myself because you know I don't know if I want to be saying this on record but for example if I receive some questions around power harassment and how people should be managing people I, I say the right thing obviously but if I reflect upon myself there are many things that I'm saying that I'm really not good at myself if you see what I mean so you've got to forget about yourself to be able to provide advice especially around those power harassment things like you know you have to stay calm you shouldn't see this and that you need to give this kind of feedback I, I'm saying the right thing. I'm trying to do it myself, but I'm not perfect. I, I, there's lots of things that I need to be doing in that area for myself. It must be quite hard, but you're saying you actually forget about yourself and and approach it in that way. Is that's the easiest way for you to do it? But I guess your employees, the associates that you're working with, you must be looking at you as, as an employer as well. So that's a tough, tough situation to be in. I would think. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I know there's a lot of things that I need to learn and improve. I always say that when I'm providing power harassment training, saying that, look, no one's perfect, including myself. So we should all, you know, be aware of that. Yeah, we are human. We can't always just be our jobs. That's for sure. So how about for others who are leading legal teams, maybe um, in smaller firms like you or or legal counsel, how they, any advice that you might have for them and how to lead a good team or how to lead a team to be good? Mm, that's a very difficult question. I'd like to know my the answer myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, you know, communication is probably very important just to take some time to speak with, with your uh, um, team. I, I need to do that much more. I, I'm quite conscious of that. Okay, I understand. So let's think a little bit more. You mentioned a little bit about COVID-19, and I think we can't avoid talking about that elephant in the room. And so before the pandemic started, were you doing a flexible working kind of scheme at Vanguard? Or was that when you really, all of you and the associates went online? How did you operate the practice over the last uh, 12 months or so? So we didn't really have a flexible scheme as such, but, it, you know, we're all grown up. So people would come to the office when they like and leave when they when they like. So, But it wasn't like once a week, everyone worked remotely. It wasn't like that before COVID. Um, during COVID, only during the where the emergency declaration was, was in place, we were working remotely. But other than that, I think we quickly came back to the office. We were quite quick. I mean, for, for example, now everyone's working from the office. And the reason for that is I just found it very difficult to integrate the team when everyone was working remotely. And we had a couple of new joiners who joined right in the middle of the emergency declaration. And it was just so difficult. And so, you know, it's much easier if everyone's coming to the office and we can actually see how people are getting on because it's a very stressful um, world now. And it's very difficult to to see who's struggling stress wise if everyone's working remotely. Mm, That's right. And so you encourage people back, but obviously they had if they wanted to stay home or they didn't feel comfortable, they could talk with you about that. So you had a kind of flexible approach to to people, but mostly they want to come back into the office yeah I just speak with my associates and, and most and my and the staff and almost all of them did want to come back to the office you know in Japan what I think is that people don't live in big houses like you know like in in, in the US or wherever and so for example our staff they would live in very small flats and you know they'd be typing from from their beds or something and I can understand that that's not very comfortable situation. Right. I understand that too. And, and you know, when you're online, you see you see that um, and you understand that people are going through those stresses of having a smaller environment. So it makes sense to come back to the office. Is there anything that changed that you would like to hold on to because of the pandemic, things that you wouldn't go back to doing again over the last 12 months, something that changed there for you? The good thing is that most of the client um, meetings are now done over like Zoom or Teams as opposed to the phone. So previously, before COVID, I had a lot of telephone conferences, calls, but not really, not so much Zoom and Teams. And I found that Zooms and Teams are actually much better, especially when you're speaking in English. So 
I'm not a native English speaker, but if you've got the camera on and you can see the people's reaction, it's much easier to speak and also understand what people are saying. And I've spoken with my associates who aren't that fluent in English, and they all say the same thing. It's just much easier, especially when you're speaking in your second language, if you can see all the facial expressions and the body language. And you, you, it's kind of amazing to, to realize how much information you're providing through sp- facial expressions and body language and all that, and not just the words. And so so it, that bit, I'll definitely would want to stick with the camera on kind of devices rather than just the telephone. Right. That makes sense because you have international clients. They wouldn't have been in Japan and they wouldn't be sitting in front of you, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. And so a lot of people have missed that people being in front of them uh, situation and, and law firms. But you're saying that you did a lot on, on the phone. So actually the enhancement has happened with having the opportunity to see people on the screen and you can actually see them rather than just the telephone call. That's a, It's really good to hear that. Yeah. yeah, because there were some clients that I've been speaking over the phone for like years and the first time I saw their face, <laughs> so I switched on the camera. I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> Hopefully it was not too much of a shock. <laughs> no. oh, well, I hope funny. it wasn't a shock for them. But anyway. Well, no. And I, I guess too, you just get so many little indicators, right, from raised eyebrows or eyes opened or furrowed brow, those kinds of things all deliver the information you need because as they say, only 7% of what we say is is actually, you know, in words is what people understand. It's all the other things that we are doing that gives you indicators of how people are thinking about problems and about issues, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, okay. So you would have still done um, employment court cases and other disputes in the courts over the time. And I heard a fair, few stories about there being a little bit of innovation at the courts, but people were still having to fax documents over and paperwork very much. So, but did you find any shift in the courts and the way they handle cases for you over the last 12 months? Yeah, so um, the courts now do the little hearings, the very short ones through teams, which is actually quite helpful because the, the, the very short hearings, they, they end in like five minutes. So you just go to the court, submit something, and then you set the next hearing date and you go back. And it's a bit of a waste of time to do that. Um, physically if it's just over in five minutes so uh, the team speed I think is working although they're not very flexible so you end up you can only have well in principle you can only have one account so that means that if I have a team of three lawyers on a case and we were doing a hearing via teams everyone has to be in the office and log on to the same and we share the same pc if you see what I mean so it's not a, yeah it's not as flexible as you would have thought it was. So you mean you're all sitting in front of the same laptop too? Exactly, yes, oh, yes. I see. You're not in separate desks with your own laptop. You're all at the same Right. Lap- right. So you had to invest in larger screens. <laughs> well, we're all kind of squashed into small screens <laughs> when we're doing this, but that's all right. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. Well, that that's really interesting. And I guess there must have been quite a few cases over this period, as you indicated before, but what kinds of cases do go as far at, to court in, in Japan for the employment area? Are most resolved outside of court, as we often hear, or is arbitration and mediation also used in Japan for employment court cases? So um, arbitration mediation is not, like, for example, an arbitration clause in an employment contract would be, would be void. So you have to go to court. However, the court almost works a bit like a mediation because, as you know, like more than 90 pay- percent of the cases end in settlement anyway so people go to the court to settle so it's it's a typical way an employment dispute will evolve is that you know retain employee retains counsel employer retains counsel you have counsel to counsel negotiations if you can't reach an agreement then you go to court with the view of having the court facilitate a settlement so it's it's all very much geared towards settlement Right. So the court helps you with the settlement. You're not really outside of the court um, settling things, although you're moving along discussions. But the court's position there is to actually try to move you to settlement rather than have a case. 
Yes, I think in a vast majority of cases, that's what happens. Mm, Okay. You can tell that I'm not as specialist as you in the employment law area, and that's why I wanted to ask, because there's probably some listeners here who may be in the same area, even though um, we are both lawyers, we all have different specialities. So the other thing I did did want to ask you was about commonly occurring problems that you've seen employers in Japan face. Perhaps over the last 12 months, that's been highlighted, but those sorts of problems around hiring people or firing people or those areas where employers could probably do a little bit of a better job to save themselves uh, later on. Is there anything around that area you'd like to tell us about? Well, the most typical um, question I get is really around uh, managing poor performers and and what to do with them. And, and ultimately, it will end up in having to exit them from the organization. Now, there are many cases where clients will come to me telling me that, you know, this, this employee is a very poor performer. He or she has always been that for, for many, many years. But then if you look at their performance reviews, they're all rated like average and there's nothing in the performance reviews that really highlights their areas of development. So I think I mean, this is all very common sense, but performance management, providing good, appropriate, constructive feedback is is very, very important. And especially in Japan, people are not very good at that. And so they don't want to upset people. So they just rate everything like everyone like average. But that's not really doing any good for firstly to the employees themselves because they're not getting the feedback that they should be receiving. If they were receiving feedback, they should have been, they might have been able to, you know, improve. But if there's no feedback, obviously they'll just continue what they're doing. And secondly, when it comes to when you fit, when the company feels like, I do want to exit this employee. If there's been absolutely no performance management in the past, of course the employee won't get it. Of course they won't understand. Of course they will get upset. So, you know, constant communication, performance management is is super important. So do you help employers to then manage how they deliver that? Because that feedback giving, as you just said, is, is very difficult in Japan. Do you help them with ways they can say that and how they should do it? Is that part of the training that you're doing to help employers? Um, I, I do sometimes do that. Like for difficult conversations, I would draft talking points and all that. But in my experience, if you've got a very good HR manager, I mean, they're, they're, they're much more better than my advice. They, they have they have lots of expertise around that. So I, I think having a very good HR person is also crucial. So I'm thinking if um, you've got a good HR person and they're they're doing a regular schedule of keeping in touch with the employee and also keeping in mind that they should be giving timely feedback. Is that is that sort of what you're saying would be one of the first tips to be giving to employers? Or are there other things that you would be advising them when you're doing this sort of onboarding of employees or through through the performance management? Um, so, yeah, so one thing is, is really the feedback that I just mentioned. Are there, I guess it's around, you know, setting the corporate culture. So, for example, on compliance kind of issues, if you really have a particular, say, value that you want to emphasize, I think training or giving, you know, tone from the top kind of messaging is, is also quite important. All right, so I'm going to jump here a little bit and go more into some things that get you ready for your day and thinking about your routine, um, which is jumping right away from what you were just talking about. But I think it's really helpful for people listening to know about how you, you know, the things that you do when you're starting off your day to get off on the right foot. Do you keep regular hours and how do you manage your day, Akiko? (laughs) Do I keep regular hours? I don't, well, I don't know. I get up at 7.30-ish and then I have a cat. I just just really love my cat. And then the cat in the morning would normally jump onto my bed. So I spend a little bit of time just playing with my cat. (laughs) And then I get ready and just go to the office. I don't do breakfast, so yes, it's just a cat and getting ready. What's your cat's name? Uh, her name is called uh, Nambararu. If you're a good big fan of Gundam, you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, but you're her name big... is Nambararu. No, I don't. Is it Nambararu? <laughs> Nambararu. Nambararu is a male character, but she's a female cat. But anyway, that's okay. She doesn't mind. Okay, that's fine. You've given a, a male, a t- technically male name to a, a female cat. Does she actually answer to that? What a mouthful to say. 
Oh yeah, so I, I, I it's yeah, it's Ramba Raru, but I only call her Raru, so she will oh, respond. Oh, she knows Raru. That's easier to say, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that would be, I guess, with having time with your cat would be um, one of the things that you do to start out your day. Is there anything else, like a tool or an object or a ritual that you do aside from being with your kitty cat in the morning? There is there another thing that you do to get yourself out of bed and and on for the day? Mm, I don't really think so. Oh, I have a. I, I I drink Japanese tea every morning. Good, right? Okay, that's very <laughs> that's good. About it. That's very that's good. About you, it. you don't have a typical Japanese breakfast. You just you have regular breakfast. Yeah, I don't really eat breakfast. I just okay. don't feel hungry when I get up. I don't know why. It's not good. Fair enough. It's, it's totally fine. And um, so is there? So you were working at home, but you're now back in the office. What's your favorite thing that you have around you in your workspace? at home when you're working at home is there some favorite object that you've got there I don't think so but again if I'm working from home the cat is there so that <laughs> I can you know <laughs> fill around with my cat your cat is very that's, yeah that's yeah. the only thing I miss about working from home okay and so when you're now back in the office so when you come back home after a day's work I'm guessing now that the best thing that you look forward to is your cat when you come in the door is that right <laughs> exactly yes and what time are so you I go home. yeah right i'll go home to see my cat yeah exactly so when you come in and do you have any other special routine in the evening are you are you out for dinner or you're you're cooking dinner at home and when do you do you put on the laptop again when you're back at home? Uh, so I go home I, I I cook I hate cooking but I have to cook so I cook right and then I and I watch a lot of TV, so I just watch TV, and then I switch on my computer and work for about an hour or even less than that. I don't work that much at home. Right. Okay. And how do you wrap up the day then? Are you, is it is it involving a kitty cat routine at the end of the day as well? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then I take a bath. I always, you know, what do you do, what do you call it? I use the bathtub. I I, right. I, I, I do a proper bath. Right. Okay, but not with your cat. <laughs> not with my cat. She no, doesn't like it. No, cats don't typically like water, do they? That's wonderful. No. All right. So I guess, you know, round about this time, if we'd been at the um, Spanish restaurant together, you would have had a few sangrias. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper here and ask you a couple of things about things that you're proud of about yourself. What kinds of traits are you really proud of is resilience one of them or being bold assertive as I said at the very beginning because you love wearing this color red what sort of things are, are you proud about about yourself I know it's difficult to say things about yourself but tell me a couple of things uh, resilience definitely and and yes I, I, I guess I am bold and assertive although I think I'm quite good at asking for help I think mm. I probably do it too much. I, I'm quite good at reaching out for help and also telling people what I'm not good at. It's a bit of you have to strike the right balance because it's a bit. There's a little bit of trying to evade responsibility there because if I go around telling people I'm not good at that, it almost kind of gives me as an excuse for not doing it. But I, 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 I tend to do that quite a lot. It's really just to reduce the stress level because you just can't do everything right. So you know, I just tend to ask people to do things that I can't do or tell people that I'm really not good at that and, you know, just really to, to, to reduce what I need to do. Well, asking for help is certainly a really important thing. What kinds of things can you tell me that you would ask for help for that you would say you're not so good at and, and go to ha get some help? Is that And is that from the associates in your firm or are you talking about people around you? Uh, both. So, for example, just some very some very basic stuff. I don't like cleaning, so I've got Duskin coming in to clean my house. Um, right. I don't like I don't like cooking, so I've got a lot of um, stuff that my mum made um, in my my fridge. So Lovely. that's one thing. Work wise, I. I hate Excel spreadsheets, so I would ask my assistants to do that. I hate numbers. I'm very bad at calculations. So if it was a very like a number of heavy thing, I'll probably have someone else do do that. So I don't do derivative lawsuits like the derivatives in in terms of financial instruments. I just don't understand them. So Kazuki does all those stuff. So you know many things or other things like. P 
picking restaurants, I'm not very good at. So I'll just ask some of my friends who are good at picking restaurants. <laughs> Almost everything. Wonderful. I mean, I'm think I'm thinking there's a few listeners who are laughing already who know that I am also not very good at numbers. I cannot stand Excel. I'm not good at calculation, and I know that my executive assistant is going to be laughing at that right now. So I think lawyers are not really generally good at that. But I'm glad to hear you've at least got one of your partners who is. So you're pulling on other people's strengths. And I think it's a strength as a lawyer to be doing that because it's very hard to ask and show that humbleness, right? So I think you've got that kind of humble um, aspect to yourself as well from what you're saying. Yeah, but like I said, it's it's it's, it's I'm sure there's a little bit of humble, but there's also a little bit of like trying to evade responsibility. That's what I think. I'm trying to strike the right balance. Yeah. But I, honestly, you and me spending our time trying to learn Excel is probably not going to happen. And also, you know, if we're not good at numbers, we're just not good at numbers. Better to ask the people who are and to have them help us so that we don't make big mistakes. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely for Excel. No, I'm never going to touch Excel. Um, how do you how do you encourage yourself then? Do you talk do you actually talk to yourself and get your mindset going in a certain way? Do you do you also have a word of the year? And I do ask my my guests this because I'm very intrigued to know if you have a, a word of the year that guides you or a theme that guides you each year that you decide upon. I don't have a word as such, but you know, I'm I'm trying to cut back on things that I do rather than trying new things. So it's kind of the same thing. I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, if, if there's something that I don't like or I'm not good at, I just should stop doing it. Right. So I'd say like streamline. Streamlining is something that you sound like you're doing, that maybe that's your theme. Probably, yes, yes. Just to find a little bit more time for myself, reduce the stress level and all that. I mean, it's not like I'm super busy, I'm really stressful, but still, you know. Just have a bit more calmer mindset, yeah. Well, being a lawyer is quite stressful. I mean, if you were not a lawyer, what would you be? Have you ever considered thinking about what that would be or, as you'd mentioned, retirement, what that might look like after you've finished? I, I mean, I'm having this same conversation with many people, but if there was anything else that sounded more interesting than being a lawyer, I would have absolutely no hesitation in just stopping being a lawyer. But I've never come across anything that that's so intriguing. So that's why I've continued to be a lawyer. It's not that I don't like being a lawyer, but, you know, if there's something else that I find very interesting, I'd be quite willing to, to switch to that. But it's just that I haven't come across anything and I probably won't. <laughs> Maybe it would be owning a cat cafe and having cats around you all the time, perhaps a cat cafe and having your mum do the catering and one of your colleagues do the accounting for you. How about that? Well, that, that would be wonderful, yes. <laughs> It's so good. Well, I, I think it's important we think about other careers and also for young lawyers who are coming up through the ranks. I think it's really good to hear someone like you give them give a little bit of advice of how, you know, they would they could be as they were starting their career and how they would like to move through their career. Is there something that Akiko would like to say that she would tell herself perhaps from 10, 20 years ago that you wish you'd known then that you'd like to let other lawyers know about? Maybe something that you wished you had done better or that didn't go quite as you'd planned um, and you'd like to provide that advice or guidance for uh, lawyers, young lawyers who are listening today. I think especially for the female lawyers, I think it's very important that you tr you, you try, if there's any opportunity to do something new, it's better to just at least give it a try because if it doesn't go well, you can always just stop doing it. The only reason why I was saying is this was that when I was with Fresh Frills for many, many years, I didn't want to become a partner for no particular reason, to be quite honest. I just thought that I didn't really want to be a partner. And then Kazuki almost like forced me to be a partner. I remember we were having this conversation when he was telling me that I had to become a partner for to continue the practice. And I was literally crying saying, I don't want to be a partner. I don't want to be a partner. But in the end, he convinced me. So I became partner. And once you become a partner, there's nothing, I mean, you're just doing the same thing with a higher pay. Of course, it's much better to be a partner. But I just didn't get that. And for some reason, I just thought that it's not a kind of a female thing to strive for partnership. But that's all very wrong. So I think the point is that 
you don't really know yourself. I think that's that's the message I'm trying to deliver. I had always thought of myself as someone who wouldn't enjoy being a partner, who wouldn't enjoy going, going independent and all that. But actually, I wasn't. So I was really, I had the wrong idea of who I was. So, you know, don't just yeah, don't just tell yourself that I'm this kind of person. I'm not very good at this and that. Because actually, if you start doing something, you're you you're always learning about myself yourself. And I'm I'm still in that phase. I think that's just really incredible advice. And I I hope people are listening to that because I think what you're almost saying there too is that others see things in us that we don't see in ourselves. Absolutely. I mean, I can give you one small story. I had always pictured myself as a very introverted person. And I had always thought about myself as that for like 40 plus years. But during the COVID, I was quite stressful not being able to meet anyone. So I was kind of doing having a chat on a group line message with my friends from junior high school. So since I was like 13, and I was telling them, you know, I had always thought that I was a very introverted person, but actually, I might not be. And everyone was like, what? are you talking about? You've never been an introverted person. What on earth are you talking about? So I was like really shocked because, you know, I mean, they've known me since I was 13 and, and the way that they saw me and the way that I saw me was completely different. So, you know, there's always something to learn. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, I was so shy at school and it was really only in my first career tour guiding that, you know, taking Japanese people around New Zealand, that it brought that out of me, that I became more confident. But I see myself as essentially shy, and anyone who is listening to this would say that's that's rubbish, but it's true. So I feel that myself, but at the same time, I maybe you are like me in that you're a little bit of both. Yeah. That you are essentially, as you because you have to be in front of people and out there, you are extroverted and to some extent, but you get exhausted as well, and you need that introversion or that time by yourself to re-energize. That's how I view things for me. So perhaps you're a little bit like that. Oh yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. Right. That's very interesting. It's interesting. good to know that you you're shy as well. <laughs> I'm I'm totally shy. I'll show you some photos late, later of me at school and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's all over my face, but I'm glad that I've come out of that a little bit. But I guess too with you you're doing not only um your law work, you're also well it is still related to law, but you're doing outside activities. Just I saw on your bio that you're also you know, you're on an audit and supervisory board at T- Kinedix, I think the name of the company yeah. is. And you're also, you know, working on building labor policy um, with the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. So those roles are really, as a lawyer, are you finding that they're quite essential for you to be able to provide back to the community and, and do other things outside of your employment lawyer role? So, yeah, so all of those um, people just f- f- for some reason asked me to be on the panel or on the board. And so I I, I generally try to do new things. So that's why I, I went on those boards. And it's been very interesting to look at the real business world or, you know, things that I would normally not experience. It has also been a good experience in that, again, it it, it, it showed Again, I, I was able to discover what kind of person I am in the sense that I'm not, I'm very good at executing things, but I'm not very good at thinking at, at a big picture level or on, on, on abstractive ideas. So being on the board, I was thinking like, actually, I'm not very effective. And so now I'm trying to learn how to be effective on those kind of panels and boards. Ah, oh, it's interesting, right? So you, it's actually a way of learning about yourself um, and finding out that you're a great executor but you're also learning how right. to perhaps think and, and learn from others on the board who are big picture thinkers. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. But I imagine you're also quite detailed minded though too. So you you might see the details, they may not see the the details and, and yet see the big picture. So you're probably complementary in that way on the board. Is that right? Um, well, I hope so, but we'll see. I'm still learning in that area. And I think too, um, as well as that, you're also, you know, you're winning these awards and um, it's amazing to see. Is is that really something that you'd recommend to other lawyers to try and aspire to? Or is that just something simply that's happened as a result of the work that you're doing? I just wanted to know if it, it's it's something that's important to you for branding or what what is it about these awards that you've been able to manage to win them? Oh, they are definitely for branding and marketing. I mean, right. I think it's very, 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 
very, very powerful tool, especially because if you're starting your own practice and no one knows about Vanguard, and say a legal counsel at X corporation wants to use Vanguard, I mean, the senior ma- management are going to say, like, who the hell are Vanguard? But if you're on, say, Chambers or if you've won employment law from there, I think it's much easier for people to retain you. So it, it's really for that purpose. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, that's that's good to hear. And I think great advice for others to, to just go and, and strive to win those and um, be seen, right? If you're going to be out there as a, an individual or running a small practice with other partners, to be seen and heard um, award-winning is a way to do that super well I'm going to finish up very shortly I I don't want to finish but I I I obviously do need to for uh, making sure that we get this out on the airwaves and I do want to wind up with the final super six which is a, a round of six quick fire questions for you that I ask every guest so the first question Akiko is if I gave you a million yen in cash in Japan where would you spend it your favorite store or destination anything one million yen I'd probably go to some kind of a beach resort in Okinawa oh nice I just spend it (laughs) yeah sounds fantastic they've got a small number of COVID people there too so it's probably quite good there um can you share a book that you've listened to recent a book that you've read shall we say or a podcast that you've listened to recently book I've um because of COVID I've been um reading a lot of um comic books manga and Mm. uh Shingeki no Kyojin I don't know what's the English title Attack on Titan Shingeki no Kyojin is a very good comic book okay that's interesting i know you have an interest in the manga area so um, if you're stuck on a desert island and you need to take one person one item and one food item what would that be uh so the cat the cat what goes to the item i guess (laughs) poor cat (laughs) the cat's the item person would probably be my younger sister because i'm I'm quite close with her and then the food would be a onigiri Oh, nigiri, yes, that will sustain you. Yes. Favorite wine, and do you wear perfume? What your favorite perfume is? Oh, I don't wear perfume. Um, right. Wine, I'm I'm not really into like the details of wines. I, I I like wine, but not really. I don't. I'm not very particular about wine. Okay, all right. And what about your bedside cabinet? What's on there? <laughs> oh, a, a stack of books that I've half read and not finished. <laughs> mm, that sounds like me. And the best, <laughs> yeah, the best place you've ever visited or well, that you want to go post-pandemic, maybe that's Okinawa, but is there another place that you'd love to go after, after this is finished and we can fly again? Uh, Laos. <gasps> Did I pronounce it properly? Yes, I think was, you're right. Uh, it was, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. So I'd, I'd love to go there again. Very relaxing. Yeah. Lovely. I haven't been there either, so that's given me some inspiration. Well, I'd really like to thank you so much for sharing your stories today, Akiko, your tips and your nuggets of advice. It's been really great to connect with you in this way, and I thank you so much. Can people get in touch with you? Y- yes, of course. I mean, um, I'm on LinkedIn, and also our website, Vanguard Lawyers Tokyo, it has my email address on it. Fabulous. So if people would like to get in touch with you, then that's the way to get out in touch with you through the email on your website or in LinkedIn. Yep. Okay, good. We'll put that in the show notes. So I'd really love to finish up there. We've had a fantastic conversation with so many different things. And I'm really grateful for you for coming on today and being my guest. And hopefully this all goes well. And we do get lawyer on air out there on the airwaves for the first season of 10 lawyers. So I just want to thank you for your honesty and Uh, your humor and of course being a real beacon of inspiration for me personally oh and last but not least a big happy birthday celebration for you on april 5th because that's when this podcast will be released thank you you're the first person to say happy birthday to me this year thank you Yay! i'm so glad and it's really exciting to have that and i hope we can have a drink to celebrate and so for all my listeners please do like this episode and subscribe to lawyer on air do go ahead and share this with this episode with someone who you think would enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer lady life. Thanks so much, Akiko. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's all for now. See you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer on Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, 
So please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer On Air. Cheers, kampai, and bye for now.